321. Welcome to Nordpod, Charles. Thank you very much for having me. It's always a pleasure to be here in your luxury and well organized studios. Oh. <laughs> That's um, yeah, okay. I buy that one. I buy yes, that one. I mean, I mean, this. Uh, I'm not used to having so much high tech around me, so so you have to bear with me if I'm a bit uh, simple and get things out of the way. Um, You're yeah. more used to sticks and rocks. Yes, 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 the desert. The desert. This is the second time you're in here now uh, on the English version. So we left off uh, when you're finished with your corporal courses in the Foreign Legion. So for the people who haven't listened before, Charles is um, 15 years uh, veteran of uh, the Foreign Legion and highly decorated with uh, lots of uh, medal of bravery and whatever. Yeah. And uh, uh, that was just the incident. I, usually I was hiding underneath and when the war was over I came out again I was the only left so they gave me all the medals so you get all the medals so that's perfect so the the um, the thing we're doing with this podcast is Charles taking taking us um, to the history in the first one the history of the foreign legion from 1831 and and up to today and explain a bit about the structure and how everything is functioning and uh, the pieces falling together and what makes the foreign legion to be a special special army or or a fighting force and in that we are also taking you are taking us through your experience from day one in the foreign legion so when we left off last time we was finished with the corporal degree you have done your uh, your demanding first training that is correct and i am um you know i if people are joining us here i really really suggest them to go and listen to to episode one first to get a clear picture of uh, of how it's all put together um so we're in the middle of the 80s sometime and uh, i'm uh, as a young corporal leaving the school regiment in the south of france and i'm transferred posted to the french foreign legion first cavalry regiment yes uh, uh, and what was the difference with the first second and third cavalry? So yeah, just you know the the that's basically uh, it all's just a tradition. So you have the first cavalry regiment. We had the second cavalry regiment, but it was disbanded after a unhappy event in Algeria at the end of the Algeria War. And uh, so we have also uh, the second para regiment. The first has been disbanded. So the number is just a coincidence, you know. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So we, we, yeah, just to follow up that a little bit, you know, we have we have two infantry regiments, we have a power regiment, we have two engineer regiments, and we have one cavalry regiment. These, these are the uh, operational uh, forces of the legion. In addition, comes the school and administration regiment, as well as the permanent uh, representations overseas in other countries. If if, um, if we're going to explain the the um, regiment and the, everything in a, in a umbrella how is it's everything structured mm, yeah yeah region? so uh and how many people's in exactly what, uh, yeah. exactly yeah so it's uh i think for those who are used to to a norwegian or a british uh, or a nato organization uh we can argue if it's a regiment or a battalion okay but a regiment is somewhere between uh a thousand to one thousand eight hundred. Yeah. Okay. So a small regiment, like the first rec, where I was, the cavalry regiment is quite small, about thousand. But a big infantry regiment can be one thousand eight hundred, one thousand six hundred. What happened is this is the uh, organizational unit uh, where the people stay in a place. So it is. Uh, the administrative structure where we will, will, will live and work together. So yeah. this, this let's say, thousand men unit that is posted in a city, yeah. okay, and it has a speciality: engineer, para, infantry. Okay, so, yeah. so to be a regiment, you have to have different branches yeah. under yeah. the same umbrella. Yeah, no, they set the umbrella over the regiment again. Yeah, that's the that is the brigade. Brigade. Yeah. Division in France, or we say brigade. This once more is a bit different in, in terminology. A, a, a brigade could be six to ten thousand men, uh, what we otherwise call a division. So they have different type of regiment. They will have an engineer regiment. In France. This can operate independently. So a regiment is more specialized and is divided into companies. You ever heard that when you were in the army? A company is somewhere between 150 and 200 men, sometimes a bit more. 
And uh, that's the next level. Uh, downwards, a regiment will have four, five, six company, and in addition, a support company. That stands for administration, uh, support, and organization, and then four or five companies, or what we call in the cavalry squadrons, that are organized as fighting units. Okay. And when you go into the squadron, you go once more down. It's exactly the same organization again. Inside a squadron, a squadron, as I said, 150 people, commanded by a captain. A regiment is commanded by a colonel. The captain is in charge of his squadron. The squadron will have four platoons, combat platoons of about 25 to 35 people, and one support platoon that provides support. And, and, and so it goes down. And then the platoon is then organized into smaller units again. So that's, that's basically organized the same way as anywhere in, in, in the world, mm -hmm. and especially is exactly the same uh, as a similar French regiment. This is completely standard French military organization. Mm -hmm. And while we are talking about the subject, uh, uh, when we come to, to um, your ranking, how is the ranking system from bottom to the top? How is uh, because uh, all times in Norway you have like the, you have the uh, the private, you have corporal, and you have sergeant, and, and you the one. But how is it this ranking system in the foreign legion? Yeah, once more, it is absolutely the same as the French army, uh, but uh, has a particularity. Uh, in the legion is that uh, we divide them into three groups. We have what we call uh, the men. Yeah, we can call them the men. In French, les hommes de rang, uh, men. We have the uh, sous officier, which is the NCO, non commissioned officers, and then we have the officers. And the officers, in general, comes from the French army. Yeah, they are French citizens. They went to uh, French military academy, and the very best of the best can then choose to serve in the legion. So we are lucky; we 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 get the best of the best from them. Uh, but they are in the legion for a short period, two okay. years, five years, and they will go back to the French army. So they just may maintain the the framework. Uh, everybody else started as a private. You cannot join any sideways. There is only one gate into the Legion. You join as a private, you are a private. After about a year, you can, or you will get, it's actually automatic these days, you will become a private first class. Private first class. That's, so that's the one first step up. One strap, one stripe, yeah. One stripe, okay, yeah. So any, he hasn't, that's an automatic step up, and it comes from the days when, um, when when um, uh, when France had conscripts, conscripts. What does it mean? Conscripts is first going to understand. Ah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Conscripts and yeah. and basically, each, yeah. yeah. So when the legionnaire has passed the time of theoretical, like the conscripts, he get one stripe because he is a professional. He has okay. he has he has gone through his teaching time and he's supposed to be a confirmed established. He get one stripe. After that, we have the corporal. Mm -hmm. Um, the corporal is uh, two green stripes. Okay, he he will have gone through a school for that. We can, yeah, we have been through that, and uh, and um, he has the leadership ship of two, three, four, up to five men, up to depending five. on the organization. Also, we we'll get the in the living area. Usually, he's in the legion. They are usually living. When you are living in camp, you have six. Uh, legionnaires per room, mm -hmm. big rooms with six beds, very cozy. So he's the leader of, of a room and he will be the leader of a jeep or a little vehicle uh, in the cavalry unit that we will talk more about or in the infantry or elsewhere he will be the leader of five men. So it's the first level of command and he is the one who makes sure that things happen. He is the first level of command. He will be in charge of making sure people get up, get there, are there on time, or organized. Then we have um, something we call a caporal chef, or a brigade chef, um, a senior corporal. This would be somebody who has been a corporal a long time, but doesn't want to become an NCO. But he is valuable 
as a specialist. So it's sort of a, not a sidestep, but he remains of the ranks. He doesn't become a non-commissioned officer, but these are the older guys that has all the key jobs. So uh, they are in charge of all the warehouses, they are the mechanics, they are the guys that has been here 15, 20, 25 years, that are the foundations of the Legion. But they still live in the same quarters as... Uh, yeah, they live in the same quarters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A little bit better, but they live among... Uh, with the, with the, but they don't share the room with the six other... Uh, uh, sometimes they can be a leader of a room if they are ill, but they can also have their own room. But it will be inside the exactly. squadron or company uh, housing yep. complex. So they, they live with them. But they are more long term. Or they will be in the support unit. So I have several friends that are doing this. They are, you know, if you go to the support company that are doing where the mechanics, the cooks, the administration, the transmissions, where all the supporter, it's filled up of this rank. Okay. Yeah. And they work there, they live there, and they, they are part of, of the system keeping it flowing. We have a very good Norwegian friend. I think he has been almost 30 years in the Legion now. Um, he's a bus driver. Yeah. So he's a bus driver at, the, at this bus station, and... Um, he goes four months on operation outside every year, and the rest of the year he's a bus driver. Okay. No, yeah, so uh, that, those are that's what's also often a difference uh, with many other units. Uh, and we were talking about difference between the legion and other units. We do everything ourselves. Yeah. We are absolutely standalone yeah. because of our past, where we operated isolated in the desert. So we are self reliant on absolutely everything, and this simplifies enormously improves enormously the operational system because everybody thinks the same way and operates in the same framework. Is it to have a communication? Yeah. So these are, as you can see, the legionnaires, the first class legionnaires, the corporals and the corporal chefs, they live in the camp and they are the bedrock of the system. They are the bedrock that is doing the work, making things happening. They are, of course, they, they, they are, and we call them on the wall. They, they are the, the essential of the troops. Mm. Then we have the NCOs. The NCOs are what we call non-commissioned officers in, in English, uh, sous officier in French. And these are, um, it's seldom, it can happen, it's seldom that a senior corporal will become a sergeant. As I said, it's more a sidestep and mm. into a speciality training. So it will be corporals that are particularly competent or like in my case, are able to pretend to be competent, <laughs> uh, that get selected and sent to sergeant course. And after a training in the Legion, every sergeant will become an infantry sergeant. Yes. Even if he's a cook, even if he's a computer specialist or he's a mechanic, it doesn't matter. First of all, he becomes an infantry sergeant. That is, to keep it very basic, from an infantry perspective, he's in charge of 10 men. Mm. 10 men, and he operates this 10 men, what we call, uh, is it squad in English, I yeah. think, yeah. He operates uh, and commands these 10 men. And then after, after becoming an infantry sergeant, they will then be sent to the training of their speciality, para, another infantry training, or cavalry training, or computer, administration, cook, uh, you name it. Yeah, And that, that's... Uh same as you talked uh, when you have uh, had that um, that fight in in Mexico, uh, they took every people together, even the cooks. But as you say, yeah. you start with the infantry. Every even if you are a computer sergeant, you gonna have to learn to be an infantryist first. Yes, yes. And, and so and they can actually use you in active duty if yeah. necessary. And 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 we have this. Maybe I I regress a bit, but uh, you know, we we'll come back. Every time we go outside on an operation, we will talk about mm. Chad today. Every time we go out on an operation, we will take support from the support company to boost the volume of the people going. So we will get several of these old guys. This, for example, my friend, the bus driver, he will join in and he will be in charge. He will get an operational job on the trip. So... Uh, we take this ex-fighting soldier who is now a bus driver, who is uh, 55, 40, 45, 55 years old, 
who has 25 years of experience in the Legion, who has been on many operations, who 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 day to day job in the Legion is being a bus driver. Then we'll say now you will go five or six months with that unit into that operation area, and he will get an operational job there. Yeah. There he can bring his experience, his know how, his of the area of how to do operations and so on, and he will support the younger legionnaires that sometimes can have been very short in. So they come in uh, to add on as the as the as the support friend. As an uncle, uh, very big uncle. Yeah. yeah. So that can uh, can absolutely happen, and this we saw as we say in coming on in Mexico, all the support people were used. Yeah. yeah. So we are a sergeant, and next step is yeah. So the so the sergeant will be in charge of 10 men or in the cavalry units he will be in charge of our main armored vehicles mm -hmm. or all the small vehicles so in a platoon there will be three sergeants and um, the next sergeant next stage is the what we call the staff sergeant the staff sergeant will have another stripe of course above them the super sergeant we go whatever and he uh, he will be the second in command of the platoon He will be supporting the officer or the uh, old NCO that is in charge of the platoon. He will be the platoon sergeant, we call it. Usually, when he is a staff sergeant, he will go through his platoon commander training. That will qualify him to become a uh, platoon commander. And um, so the, the, the staff sergeant, we call them chef. It's confusing for the English because a chef in English is a cook, yeah. but um, we call them chef. Uh, they are the backbone. They are in charge of keeping the whole platoon together, these 35 guys. Usually we will have a young lieutenant as a platoon commander coming from academy or military academy. In in our case, uh, the French Cavalry Military Academy. So they they will have very long French noble names. They are young, they are very honest, they are very Catholic, but they know nothing about nothing. So he will be the guy in charge of keeping control of all this and keeping the, the unit together. And um, after that, we have a rank called Agilo, which is then, it changes, uh, the rank structure changes, you will see on the stripes, people can lock it up. These are, we have we have two ranks that are Agilo, Agilo Chef, Agilo and Senior Agilo. These are actually Uh, in the British system, warrant officers. So they are officers or platoon commanders without being it. They came from zero all the way up through the ranks and they will be in a, in a military unit. They will be either platoon commander of a combat platoon or the, char the in charge of the support platoon in the squadron. And there is no difference between adjutant and adjutant chef. Well, the adjutant is very often young, intelligent, formal storming, And, and and brilliant. You can see his intelligence. The adjunct chef is a bit older, fatter, and, and, and drinks much more. This is the tradition. Yeah. I'll let you get guess what I was. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, we have one uh, rank, which is called major, which is also confusing because it has nothing to do with the British major, but we would call the regimental sergeant major in the British system, or a senior warrant officer, which is... Uh, usually the oldest non-commissioner officer in the regiment, and he is in charge of the discipline for all the enlisted men, yeah. all the non-officer men. Yeah. After that, the officers are like everywhere else in the world, uh, often unexperienced in the beginning, very good after, and brilliant after a longer time. Yeah. Second lieutenant, lieutenant captain, Major, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, and a whole list of generals. Yeah. Yeah. But they are in their own world. But um, I must say I have always been most of the time pleasantly surprised by by the officers in the Legion. Yeah. Uh, of course, <coughs> we are not going to mention any names. I've been the old idiot. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, in general, they are very good. And I see now years later, I've I always been impressed by their their honesty and their trust they had in us so yeah and when you uh, stopped as a legionnaire you was sergeant major yes i was an adjutant yeah adjutant, yeah. 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 yeah yeah after 15 years yeah 15 years. i was adjutant and i was going to become adjutant chef at the end of the year yeah then i retired because things were different yeah 
So that is the 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 rank structure, and I think we we have to we can all, we can put the officers to the side. Is not my speciality. We'll talk a bit about it, but we have the enlisted men, we have the NCOs, and as you can see, these people, particularly the legion, they can operate every operational part of the units. <laughs> so they are there to get the machine. So why are they different to other units? Well. Um, they are often much older. It's not uh, uncommon to have people that are 45, 50 years old that are staff sergeants or adjutants or, or senior corporal, corporal chefs. So that gives us an, an opportunity to have, um, have people that are, that are um, exceptionally experienced in their work. They are there for the long term and they have been on so many operations everything goes on rails there is not a there is no turnover like in the nope. like in, in in normal forces and this is another thing that i think the legion has understood is that um, we always keep ourselves to the unit the mu postings are not for war operation are not individual it is the unit that okay. they get sent yeah. always, if bigger or smaller, it depends on the operation. But it's never individuals that are sent. And many Western armies, they are individual based. So they will, they will go to an operations area, create a unit, and they will send individuals and take individuals out. Okay, that doesn't work because each individual has to learn and adapt. We take the unit, we move it out, we move the unit out. Mm. Um, so I arrived there, mid eighties, mm -hmm. first rec, and um, then the, you're then you are a corporal then. Then I'm a young corporal, yeah. and uh, it's very interesting. <coughs> uh, you have to people have to go on Google and look up France if they don't remember. But uh, uh, all the regiments in the Foreign Legion are in the south of France or in, in Corsica. So for a young Norwegian, it was very interesting. Uh, uh, the cavalry regiment is based in a little city uh, called Orange, and it's uh, in what we call Provence. So, if you look at Marseille, you go straight north 100 kilometers, you get to Avignon, and another 20 kilometers, you get to Orange. Orange is an old Roman city with an amphitheater like Colosseum, full of vineyards, good weather, nice climate. Unfortunately, we are never there. But it's uh, it's it's like a dream posting, and um, Orange, being a small city, about thirty five thousand people, yeah. uh, mainly lives by the military because it has an air base, an air force base. It has a French gendarmerie, a mobile unit, anti riot unit, and it has the legion. So most people living in, or at least used to live in this city, was was military personnel. And the Legion lives in, as usual, very old camp in the middle of the town. Old fashioned, but kept spotless. So um, it was very impressive to arrive uh, in a bus there uh, on October evening and to see this uh, immaculate place because the Legion spent a lot of time on fixing, painting, uh, cleaning, fixing up things. So. People traveling in France can see that France can sometimes be messy, but it completely changes once you pass the gate uh, to enter the Legion. Um, even the trees are cut, uh, every yeah. branch is cut, and every little strip of uh, asphalt is cleaned and polished. Every, what do you call it, uh, um, pavement uh, corner is painted white. All the buildings are spotless because the sergeant major in charge of that building will not accept that anybody can tell him that his building is bad. So everything is kept, kept very, very nice. So you become very impressed. And it's part of the goal mm. to, to show that um, <clears throat> this is something we have together. So I arrived there. I was posted to the third squadron, which is equivalent to the third company. Uh, third platoon, and um, the cavalry regiment has existed since 1921. 
Uh, it was uh, started in 1921 in Tunisia, uh, following the end of the First World War, yeah. the collapse of Russia, Russian Revolution, and over 90% of the unit was put together by Russians. Okay. Yeah. So everybody, <coughs> the first 10, 15, actually, I think almost up to the Second World War, the majority of the legionnaires was Russian. So we have a very strong Russian cavalry tradition. Also in France, I think we have to, to keep in mind, we have two types of cavalry, uh, heavy and light. Okay. Uh, it comes from the days of the horses, uh, different ways of attacking. And um, today it is based, do they have tanks with tracks that are heavy? As you know, uh, we have in Norway, we have everywhere. Or do they have light armored vehicles for long distance reconnaissance? Quickly. Yeah. Or everything is on wheel. We have the heavy cannons, but they are on wheels. Everything, so it's very mobile and very autonomous. We can operate on our own very far. So the Legion cavalry is obviously of the light cavalry. Actually organized around the, uh, I think we can call it hussar. You know, have heard of hussards? No. Oh. Your, your military tradition is disastrous. I don't know if you have seen in films, you know, from the old days or from when people were working, you have these people that have these stripes here on the uniforms. Have you never seen yes, that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You see what I mean? I think so, yeah. Like, like ropes. Yeah. Yeah? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, from yeah, all, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Hussar comes from Hungarian. Ah. The number 20 in Hungarian is Hus. Ah. It was a tax in this area, in the uh, Hungarian spoken areas of Europe, that the village had to provide every 20th man as a soldier, as a light cavalry soldier with armor. They didn't have money, so the armor was ropes oh. that they put around. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. yeah. That's what we call a hussar. So, hussar is a light cavalry guy with a horse and a light armor, and he will have a corb corbed saber because he don't uh, stab? he don't stab he cut yeah. he cut through the enemy so this is the light cavalry tradition and it has drifted over the years of course in 1931 it was still like that we were on horses but today uh, uh, we have in a platoon to take the basic uh, of these 30 35 guys we will have three armored vehicles that means they are they look like a tank, but they have wheels and they have a gun on top. And three of these with four people in each. And then we will have three jeeps, or three light armored vehicles. We will have two motorbikes. And we will have uh, two or three trucks. Yeah. So as you can see, we have three armored elements with firepower. We have three light scout vehicles with machine guns or light things. Working on the flanks. And we have motorbikes. That is even or more on the flanks. So all this and trucks to, to support us. Yeah. With more ammunition and food and... Yeah, yeah, gasoline whatever. Stuff, yeah. Yeah. It, it all depends on the configuration. Um, so these are a very, very light armor. The point is that we put them in aeroplanes. They cannot jump in parachute, but they can be flown anywhere in the world. Quickly. Yeah. Very quickly, yeah. 24 hours, we're gone. So, and, and it's, they are, the unit is autonomous. So they can drop us off at an airfield in Africa, anywhere, and we can go 800 kilometers yeah. alone, self-sustainable. Yeah. That's the whole goal. So I integrated a platoon of this. Uh, as a young corporal, I was, it were already rumors that we were going to, to Chad quite soon. So I was, um, immediately sent to all the courses because uh, in order to have a maximum flexibility, we used three different type of armored vehicles. Okay. Okay. Heavy, less heavy and light. So it's completely three different models, three different types, and we will take what we need or what is available where we get. Yeah. So basically it's an Amex 10 RC, which is the, the main you we use uh, which is a 105 millimeter 105 105 millimeter gun is like a modern tank it has all the systems it's about 19 or 21 it depends on the equipment we have ton 
can go at 110 kilometers per hour and has a range of 800 kilometers. Oh. Then we have a medium lighter one, which is called ERC-90 Sage, which is a 90 millimeter, yeah. three people, uh, a little bit more heavy, a little bit modern, but um, not always available. And then we have the older version, which is called the AML, 90 and 60. That is smaller. It's all has like a Beetle engine uh, in the back, two liter uh, Beetle oh. engine, uh, yeah, four cylinder opposed. Nice. And uh, and uh, and has a ninety millimeter cannon. I think it's about on a Beetle seven. engine. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's not a Beetle engine, engine, but it's the same. It's a four cylinder opposed, yeah. air cooled, um, very simple machine. Everything is hand driven. Even the turret, you have to turn with your arms. You have so. the turret. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the turret is uh, is the way you can turn the cannon. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So anybody so, interested, so look it up. AML ninety. You have to. Yeah, yeah. And you got two gears, and yeah, it's it's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> but a fantastic little machine uh, that has a lot of autonomy. Uh, you drop it out of the plane, uh, and it goes. You know, uh, never break down. Or is it well, they break down all the time. Do something wrong to it, they break down. So, okay, you so, have to treat them right. Yeah, that's well, that's another point. Um, that's how the Legion survive. Uh, we treat the material right. Yeah, and how can I say? Uh, A few years later, we went to the Gulf War, yeah. and my driver uh, in those days, I was a tank commander, my driver, his name was Schmidt, still alive, very good man, hello Schmidt. Uh, he was at that time 48-ish, oh. Oh, well. he had been, in the, he was a German from East Germany, he had been 15 years a mechanic in the East German Merchant Navy okay. on ships. After 15 years there, he jumped up off in a western city somewhere, joins the Legion, becomes a tank driver. And our tank, when we left for the Gulf, was eight years old. He had collected it from the factory eight years ago. Oh. And he was the driver of it. So you can see the experience this guy have. He know his tank. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If the engine make a little hiccup, he... Hmm? Ah, scheiße. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, this give you an idea. It was just to give you an idea yeah. how yeah. we value the, the knowledge of, of, of uh, and how we use the, the experience and the opportunities we take from all over the world to, to make the best use of them. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I've been thinking about the, if you uh, compare to the Norwegian army and, uh, and when you draft it in there, mm. uh, example, you get uh, um, a mission, you're going to be at a... Um, Truck driver, mm. you're gonna drive truck with people from back, yeah. Mm. And you come from middle of Oslo. Mm. You never driven a truck before. You have no interest. If it's a Scania or if it's a Volvo, you don't really care. You don't jack shit about engine, and you drive that for like nine months. Mm. You go back home, and you not sit in a truck the next ten years, and then you can be drafted again. Yeah, that's a disaster, you know, in in uh, icy roads in Norway because. If you go become a truck driver, you have to drive for many years, and you have to know your trucks, you have to know your engines, and uh, and uh, or else you are a danger for for uh, for the streets. Exactly, I, I'm not allowed to say anything bad about the Norwegian no, armed no, forces. No, 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 no. I've never been there. I no, never no, allow no. myself a no. comment about them. I shouldn't. Um, but um, yeah, we experienced that. I was in Bosnia some years later, up in Mount Igman there in a civilian war. And that's where we saw the, the United Nations stupidity at its best, uh, because uh, United Nations, in its big wisdom, had decided that the unit next to us should be a squadron from Bangladesh. Okay. So we said, okay, uh, why not? And the problem is they sent the unit from Bangladesh, where nobody had a, or very few had a driver's license, but it didn't matter uh, to United Nations. They sent them to Germany, three weeks training on old Russian trucks from the East German that was left over there for years. And after a few weeks of training in Germany, they sent them to the Winter Mountains in Yugoslavia, thinking it would work. Okay. That's of course, a disaster. So a we disaster. ended up with a double job, yeah. I drove driven a lot of heavy equipment 
through x rays and trucks and everything mm. and bulldozers my life myself but you can you have to drive a lot mm. to be a good driver mm. to to don't get stuck or get get yourself in trouble and and uh, and some people just have it in their hands you have to have some feelings mm. for your equipment you know same same with your rifle mm. you, you need to you need to know your rifle sure yeah sure absolutely you need to know and drill and training is essential and it's essential that you take the time to give it to everybody because you might need everybody yeah mm. hey, even as a simple thing as a rifle you know uh, every um, every rifle have a different trigger point mm. and uh, when you get uh, used to your dr- takes you a long time to get the feel mm. of the rifle you know the shot is not the same with the first shot and the tenth shot when when you get some temperature in your barrel you know you need to know mm. your equipment yeah it's um the legion perspective is is, is i think uh, we might spoke about last time but we can take it again it's i think it's it's an interesting pers- perspective is that i i used to have a platoon of about 35 guys my goal is not to have super marksmen my goal is that at 200 meters every shot is a kill mm. every shot mm. and that's what you have to work for you know, the whole platoon is not better than the worst guy no. so the the goal is to bring everybody and up to a certain level yeah and don't don't you cannot negotiate on that level because then you know what your level is mm-hmm. so then when i get in when i train all the guys to you know half of them can shoot at 400 meters that's mm. not the question yeah but I'm sure that everybody in the platoon has a kill at 200 meters every time. Mm. Then I know when I come into the combat zone, I know at what range I'm comfortable telling people start shooting. Mm. So that's, I think in a nutshell, the Legion, solid base, construct on a solid base and move with that. Mm -hmm. Mm. And I think many Western armies have been fooled by a long time in peacetime and a lot of films. Mm. So they like to train. Uh, they like to train on the sexy things. Mm. But it's not the sexy things that is going to fuck you up. <laughs> <laughs> it's the simple things. I, I think you remember we had a, in a country we know very well, we had a, we had a terrorist incident 10 years ago. And... Uh, Apparently there was a young man uh, killing people on an island mm. or killing children. And uh, this country, they uh, I heard they had the best police in the world. They had the best police forces in the world. Uh, they, this country is always the best, actually, I've heard also. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And um, while these terrorists are killing the children, the best police arrive, but the dinghy with the engine wouldn't start the was a leak, uh, it took time. And that's the difference with Legion. Mm -hmm. Our engine starts, our material is checked, everything is checked, it's boring, it's horrible, but everything is checked and done, and we move always with two points of support and one kicking. And that works. That works. It works every time. 10 out of 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, don't get sophisticated. That's the point. Keep it simple. Yeah, yeah. Kiss. Okay, we are back in your. Uh, you're in the, um, orange. Orange. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I arrived in the third platoon. We were digressing. Yeah, I did all the training, uh, and uh, it was decided that the squadron would uh, join an urgent operation in Chad. Chad. Where's Chad in? There? So we have to go to Google and open the map of Africa. We can put it in there too, I think. Yeah, but people can do it too, yeah. you know. If they're too lazy, they shouldn't be listening, actually. So open up Google, twats, and uh, <laughs> look at Africa. In the center of Africa, you have the northern center of Africa. You have Sahara. In the middle of Sahara, south, there is Chad. Chad is half Sahara and half south of what we call the, the Bushveld, south of Sahara. So it's a very, very big country. I think uh, bigger than most countries in Europe. 
and um, it is a former French colony with the defense agreement. Uh, and I think they were independent in 1960s, like that. Um, but uh, as most African countries, a very, very unstable political situation. And it has been on and off. I think uh, I think the Legion has been operating there in the 69, in 70, in 74, in 78, in 82, in 83, uh, 84. Well, and uh, goes on, yeah. yeah, it goes on. So... Um, they either have uh, civil wars or they have problems with their neighbor in the north, which is Muhammad Gaddafi in those days. Yeah. This was the case for our, our operation, which is called the Operation Epervier, if anybody wants to look that up. And um, the squadron was uh, decided over New Year to, to, to go to Chad. So uh, after a strong preparation, very interesting, uh, of course a very high learning curve for me as a young corporal, uh, I had to prove every day that I knew what I was doing, uh, and it uh, actually wasn't always the case. So you so, get tested on a daily basis, yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, you know, there is n- there is no room for it. As we said in the first day, there's always a reality check. It's what separates us from the rest of society. You are making sure the engine on the dinghy is going to start. Yes, because it's tested every morning, every day every 10 times you know it's the processes are established i'm digressing a little bit the processes are established from over 100 years of experience in military military operations that never stops and you always have 50 percent that has been on military operation before so there is there is a knowledge there is a know-how there is a tradition that is established and um uh, the departure was you know of course, exceptionally planned, uh, step by step by step. Everything is checked, you know, three underwear and five pair of socks, and you know, there is nothing left uh, to 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 um, azar, you know, even what we bring. And as you know, we have no family. We have no family. We are all living together. No goodbyes. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> goodbyes. Yeah, there were some girls in town, but we wouldn't know anything about that. Yeah. <laughs> and. Um, the squadron then about 100 and let's say 150 is a small squadron um, is put on two uh, DC-8 French uh, transport planes. DC-8 is it still a propeller then? No, no, it's a jet first. A jet? Right? Yeah, yep. France has a lot. American built actually. Is it DC-7? No. DC-7 is four propeller. DC-6 yeah, so. is four propeller. DC-4. Yeah. yeah. But um, they have a jet engine. Yeah, four yeah. jet engines. It's like it's like looks like the planes we have today, just a bit older. Yeah. Okay. Is it size-wise same as the Hercules we have in Norway? No, no. It's like uh, like the Boeing from Norwegian that okay. you are flying okay. to. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's it's a normal passenger plane. Yeah. Just in 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 military colors. In, in, in military colors and. Um, that's when I got my first French passport, uh, mm. a completely fake one, but a, a fake real because, of course, we are flying over, you know, Italy. We couldn't fly over Libya for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Algeria is not so fond of seeing us, so uh, we would fly over uh, out from France, over Italy, over the Mediterranean, down to Egypt, over Egypt, over then Sudan, and then we'll turn west to get into... You have to yeah. stop to get fuel? No. No, straight no. line. But we will always be dressed in, in civilian. Okay, so you travel civilian? Yeah, we're traveling in, uh, well, military boots. <laughs> <laughs> and jeans. <laughs> military boots, jeans, and a green t shirt. <laughs> yeah. Military underwear. Yeah. yeah. So, but, but, yeah. But, uh, and we would have all have fake French passports in no. case we were landing somewhere. But no weapons in this plane. The weapons are in the cargo hole. Okay. The weapons are always in the cargo hole, and and the platoon sergeant, the guy in in charge, will have in his pocket all the firing pins. Okay. So yeah. they they are not you cannot use them. Yeah. This is the normal standard practice. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I I don't remember how long time this flight was oh. to 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 Chad, but it took a while. The capital of Chad is in Jamena. We are landing there. Uh, 50 degrees, sunshine, it's uh, it's quite a shock. You get out of the plane, uh, especially oh. me from northern Norway. Uh, yeah, uh, 
already summer in France was a shock. This was a this was a complete new life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did you think, of, fuck, what I'm living myself into now? You know, you're in you're you're in you're in the drive. Yeah. You know, you're just you're just uh, drinking all this information. You know, you get out of the plane. You know, smells and everything. Yeah, yeah. Africa smells special. Uh, nothing bad about that, but it smells special. And you get out there and. You know, I was interested in aeroplanes. I could see all these aeroplanes more or less working, hanging around there from even from the 30s. It is a dusty old airport. Uh, some soldiers are hanging around, some some Chadian soldiers. They didn't look very disciplined. And the heat is enormous, you know. And we have to get all our kits out and we line it up. And, and uh we had to wait for hours because you know these things are organized by the air force and then nothing works you know but that's that's another problem <laughs> uh and uh, and we are um, finally got two french air force transport planes these are tactical a bit look like the norwegian hercules but smaller they are called c160 turns out they are a bit smaller and t- twin engine yeah, yeah. turboprop and they will fly us up to our base in a place called Musou. That's the but then you have your equipment with you and everything. Mm. Or you're still in... Uh, we are still nude because the equipment is is there. Okay. Yeah. So, and and a, a detachment has left one week earlier, I didn't mention. There is a little, what we call precursor. There's a little team leaving early to go there to take charge of uh, the material, all the equipment from the unit who was there before. They are leaving. Okay. In this case, it was terrible because the equipment was in storage. Mm-hmm. So, and we'll, we'll, we'll get yep. there. Yeah. So we don't have anything else than our bag and and our guns. Yeah. And we get put in these uh, French Army transport planes, uh, and we are flown up the desert. And of course, the French Air Force are there, uh, young guys, uh, brand new pilots, and uh, they like to fly low. So. I think we never went over 100 feet. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Just licking the ground. Full speed licking the ground. They were burning fuel like crazy. They were having fun. Yeah. How how that went well over all these years, I don't know. But it was uh, quite an experience. And um, once more, we are in the modern world. Huh? You can go on, on YouTube today and you can click on French Air Force Chad. You will see... Uh, they they have quite a lot of fun there. No regulations, no rule, war operations, and in those days it was different. Um, after the flight, they were landing in a place called Museau. Once more, people log on. They look on uh, on the map. It is the center north of uh, of Chad. Museau is a little city. Um, no, it's a little village. There is no houses over two floors. Actually, there isn't any houses. They're just huts. Yeah. Uh, there is no tarred roads. Uh, it's all in the desert. There is uh, wells and water towers and an old fort, like the Legion forts you can have seen in the in the movies. And we land there in the sun uh, late in the afternoon. And uh, without further ado, we are taken just north of the town. Uh, I don't know who built it. Probably some French uh, uh, aid in the in the sixties or in the seventies. Somebody had tried to build a school with three, four buildings that now had fallen completely down, um, and there were no roofs, no, no nothing. And we take charge of these uh, buildings. Our material was stored in that area, so French has been in operations there two or three years before. They just kept the equipment. Yeah. So we pulled it out of the dust. And, um, well, the Legion system kicks into gear suddenly. Um, most armies in that case would just install themselves temporarily. And since they were not going to stay there forever, just pack out the quit and make uh, make an easy the most easiest and comfortable solution, which makes sense. In the Legion concept, we don't do like that. Um, we need to take ownership. Don't forget, we didn't leave anybody behind in France. Uh, it is 
us as the group, as the unit, as the family, as the brotherhood, as a church even. We arrive there and we have to take complete ownership of the of the installations. So new roofs are built, everything is cleaned. We have of course not much space for a platoon, but we put up the same thing that we had in Orange. Same rooms, same, now not normal beds, but uh, folding beds and everything is cleaned and made ready and every bag goes exactly where it should be so that everybody in the dark can find everything without any problem. Uh, corners are painted so they can be seen in the dark. Uh, flagpoles are put up, everything is cleaned. Uh, it's an interesting process, but we make a camp. Make a camp. But not just a camp. We make it. It's really, really uh, important to to make a camp that belong to us. Maybe I'm a little bit deep in the psychology. We'll get to lighter things. But you have to take ownership. So the point at the end of the day is that every legionnaire that's arrived had to work hard for X amount of time to see the result of the work that we put together. We made together and we made something mm -hmm. that is ours. And that is what we build our unity on. Don't forget, we come from all kinds of nationalities. So building the squadron is a very, very important part of our psyche. Mm. And um, once we have built that, we have to take care of the vehicles. I'm not boring. Huh? No, no, going no, too no, much no, into no, details. No, no. It's good, <laughs> yeah. good. Um, these vehicles had been in storage, so there was a type of AML. So we have the, every platoon will have three AML. This is this light armored car with a 90 millimeter gun on top. It looks like a tank, but you have no tracks. Yeah, yeah it's, it's tiny. It's, tiny. It's, it's like a big beetle with a turret on the top. Okay. They are very, uh, very compact, um, but, but uh, absolutely made for African uh, environment, and they are made for being transported by plane, and they are made for long range and for simplicity. Uh, but it's still an air-cooled French engine, so you have to take care of it very careful, you know. But uh, we, we get around that. And then we would have three jeeps, so there will be three person in each AML. Three times three is nine. Yep. Then we have three jeeps with three people. That's 18. Then we have the people in the truck and the motorbikes. The motorbikes were dead, so we left them on, uh, where they were. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a small platoon. Uh, for my case, I, I was in charge of, of, a, of a machine gun jeep. So I have a jeep with three guys and a 7.62 machine gun called an AA-52. I'm not sure. I'm because we were changing caliber. Was it a seven five or a seven point six two? It's not a important. Belt machine gun. Belt fit. Belt Box two hundred rounds. Uh, on the on the uh, on the passenger side. Yeah. And move around, and one guy in the back. Uh, yeah. And the jeep was the same jeep as we saw in Second World War Two, was it? Uh, exactly. It was a village jeep, exactly the same as got off the beaches in uh, Normandy. Uh, the French after the war constructed on license by a company called Hoskins. Oh. So they constructed a few Jeeps. Um, I think this one was from 48. And um, the driver I had was uh, another guy, I forgot his name. Anyway, uh, uh, very experienced guy and he immediately saw this Jeep has been in the Air Force before because it hasn't been approved at all. So that's usually what we thought. When things are <laughs> shit, they have been in the Air Force. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The Air Force guys will hate me. Uh, they are very good. Uh, the Air Force is very good with aeroplane. With yeah. everything that's not aeroplane, they're horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Probably they don't care. <laughs> yeah, they, they actually, exactly. If it don't fly, they don't care. Exactly. I, I wish the Air Force would apply the same seriousness and rigor as they do with aeroplanes with the rest of the things. But uh, that's another story. Yeah. Um, so we have to keep in mind that we are going... Uh, there, there is a war going on between Chad and Libya up north, a bit further north from where we were. And uh, 
uh, it's been going on for a while and and um, and Gaddafi is losing because the French have pushed in a lot of support not officially but um, yep. yeah made sure the Chad- Chadians had, and they are brave soldiers uh, I would never say anything wrong about them they, they I have <coughs> seen them in action they they are brave um, very brave and and um, so they are more or less uh, the the the, um, the Libyans are more or less being pushed back out at the stage we are coming. So our job is to go up north and patrol the area and and ensure that uh, the uh, the end of operations goes as planned. It was not still unsure. Um, this makes we are making about eight hundred kilometers patrols. Eight hundred is a good uh, from a logistic point a range of the cars and what we can carry of fuel. Food and water, 800 kilometers, seems to be a, um, a, a good average for us. Mm. If you go further, um, it becomes complicated, or you or you need a you need a, a additional support. So back to the reality checks. You know, this is not uh, this is not uh, France. You know, you cannot stop next to the road. You know, yeah. so so we take the vehicles to pieces to make sure that they are okay. Literally? Literally. Huh. Yeah, we take the, 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 the case of the, the, the Jeep, we take it off the chassis, the, the, the mechanical crew fix the whole powertrain. The powertrain is the engine, the clutch, and the gearbox, and all the uh, axles. Yeah. Yeah. They take it up, open, checks that it's, that it's in well working order, and we, the crew, we check everything else. We put in extra screws where experience tells us we should have extra screws. We, we weld in extra plates where we know it will break. We change the suspension, check the suspension. We grease, you know, grease nipples. Um, I don't know how many there are on the Jeep. There is a lot, I forgot. Uh, yeah, um, we have to grease everything, but as you know, grease in sand is not a good plan. So we grease them, we cover them, um, so they are not exposed to the elements. So the Jeeps are completely checked, and the driver is absolutely responsible for the Jeep, and the Jeep commander, me, my career is depending. My my status as a, as a corporal in the Foreign Legion is depending on that I'm not breaking down. Mm. I mean... I can have a breakdown, you know, if the engine explodes due to being a 50-year-old engine, that doesn't matter. But if you have a breakdown that has shown that I haven't been careful, I'm done. Mm. I'm not done, but my reputation is done. Uh, And this is, maybe we didn't talk about it too much. I'm more or less exposed to religion as some sort of happy, happy party. But it's not a happy party in that way. Is that if you are responsible, you are responsible. And... You have to prove every day by a reality check that you are up to spec because everybody is depending on you and you are depending on everybody. So we have to take the Jeep to parts, to pieces, very, very, very consciously and put it together and make sure that it really, really is up to spec. And we change the whole electrical system, recable. All this takes, I think, one or two weeks. Uh, but then you are sure what you have. Uh, I mean, yeah. The Jeep is in itself is quite simple, and that's why I'm happy. And this is probably one of the problems that um, that uh, that modern armies are meeting today is that the vehicles are so complex that this is not possible. Yeah, and you end up with a pro- the product that is maybe reliable or is not reliable. But in, in our in our unit, it's it's simpler. We use very simple material. Anyway, the point is to get from A to B. Mm. And there is no armor on the Jeep. So your armor is your speed and your intelligence. Mm. So, uh, and the Jeep is so light, you can lift it out. Mm. Uh, if you get stuck in the desert, you can lift it out. Uh, just get more than five guys and uh, it can move. Yeah. Yeah. Where was I? Yes, you <coughs> you uh, get your vehicle ready, <coughs> and uh, up north, yeah, uh, you're going to go up and patrol. so, of course, uh, then the the operations of uh, of patrol is going to start, and uh, as you know, a squadron has, I told you, four combat platoons, and one support platoon, mm. all operating out of these bays. Mm. Actually, we would move a little bit further north to a place called Salal, 
and uh, put a forward base there to then push forward forward north. And this is the, uh, you haven't heard, maybe the Jurab Desert is very interesting. Um, this part is the south of Sahara. Mm-hmm. It's a huge undulating, uh, not flat, but a very interesting floating desert. Um, it is a, it is an old lake. Today we have Lake Chad. There's a lake in Chad that is close to Njamana, which is not so big, it's still a substantial lake. But the old Lake Chad was bigger than Germany. Oh. So this part of the country, or most of the country that is today, Chad used to be a huge lake when Sahara was not Sahara, when it was green. It has several happened several times in our, our history. And so we're actually driving on the bottom of an old lake for hundreds of kilometers. So you see all these fossils, all these uh, shaping grounds. It's a bit strange because you can actually understand you are at the bottom of a sea. Yeah, yeah. you get the feeling, you know, and you can imagine the desert and I, I, I you know, you see these uh, fossilized or stone trees sticking up or that was the old uh, shorelines or you can find a lot of bones, a lot of fossils laying around. Actually, our ancestors are from there. Some year later, in 2002, I think, um, a French uh, paleoanthropologist searching for our human origins, he found uh, a skeleton there of um, that he called Tumai. He's eight, seven million years old, and it's the oldest human ancestors oh, we yeah. know about. That's crazy. Yeah, so... Um, so I have a lot of history in this desert. Oh yeah, yeah. No, it's amazing. It's yeah. it's it's really interesting. So we are not a hundred percent sure, but the oldest ancestral ape walking on two legs—that's uh, the point—was walking on two legs. Uh, we have no about in the world. Is this they call it Tubai, Tumai? Uh, was found in this area. So hmm. probably that's where we come from. Yeah, all humans on this planet. So anyway, we were we were uh, we were patrolling in this area all the time, and to take us such a long eight hundred kilometer trip will be on patrol. And uh, I don't know if you have time to get into tactics or something yeah, like this. Sure. sure. Yeah, I don't want to bother our, our people with details, but ah, um, they can turn off and listen yeah. to something else. It's <laughs> yeah. No problem. Yeah. As long as I can hear. Yeah. So um, I light armored. Uh, reconnaissance in, in desert environment that is really our speciality as we go back to we have three armored vehicles three jeeps let's put the trucks in the back they are following up a little bit later the usual operation would be to have one AML one armored car and one jeep up front okay and they are covered by the two other yeah okay and the first one is moving stops until the other comes up can cover him and he moves on. We call it bull de billard, like playing billiards. Okay, yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. And it's all going in these two 4,000 meter bubbles where he can see. So he will move up to a point where he can see and cover and the other one comes up, catches up with him, can see the same area, moves on, he moves on. That's usually the sergeant. Uh, this old saying in, in first uh, rec or in the French cavalry, when the sergeant explodes, it means we have found the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this goes on the whole day, and I am in the, in the, in the MG uh, Jeep. I am usually, in this case, because the enemy was either in front of us or to the east of us, I would be on the flank yeah. covering. So... My goal is to still see the first armored car far out there, also contact with the center, but I'm also the liaison with the trucks behind. Yeah. And I'm the one who's going to hold back a bit. I have the flank, but I also have the contact with the trucks Okay. to keep everybody. So I, I'm the only idiot who has to keep everybody in sight. Okay. And I'm also not on the track. If, if there is a track, for them to drive on the, in the desert, I'm not on the track. I have to find my own track. Yeah. So we are moving the whole day out on the flank, 50 degrees, sun is shining, is the desert. 
the Jeep is running all the time. You know, the engine, the, the cooling of the engine is run directly. It's not an electrical engine. How do we say the old fashioned? Yeah, beltway. Yeah, it's yeah. the beltway. So you need to have a certain RPM to actually cool. To cool it's yeah. counterintuitive. Uh, and we have to select our road all the time. If we get blocked, we have to lift him quickly out of the sand or yeah, we become experts. So it's a very dynamic job. Nobody speaks on the radio. It's all done by click. Radio silence, yeah? Uh, the radio silence. The, the first time when he stop, he clicks, click. And everybody here is just one click. And when the platoon room commander comes up to him and he's happy, he's ready to go, it's click, click. And so it's all click, 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 mm. click, click the whole day. Nobody talks. Nobody talks. And it's all dynamic. It's a fantastic job. Um, and me out on the flank with my, my, my two guys in the Jeep, uh, we are just trying to but observe the danger area and my driver is trying to keep us out of shit because we are maneuvering uh, among you know all these dunes and all that so it's uh, but uh, on your jeep you have a belt fed machine gun yeah yeah but uh, what do you have a side armor on you or what what else oh we will use famas famas yeah. yeah yeah we all have a famas and i had a that's a machine no it's an assault rifle 5.56 uh, bull pop as we call them yeah. um very very reliable uh Very good. I never had any problems at all with it. Of course, in Chad, it will be no whatsoever oil on any of the guns. No, 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 no. they're dry, completely dry. Dry. And do you have any sidearms? No, on you? no. I don't. You, in the tanks, they will have. Yeah. In the armored cars, they will have of, of, for practicality. Yeah. But also outside, we will not use sidearms. They're they're useless. You yeah. Know? yeah, yeah, yeah. They, but you don't have any rifle with scopes and stuff like this. There is one in the other jeep. In another jeep. Yeah, we in one. another jeep. We will have one in the. <coughs> we have a, a what we call a FRF one or a FRF two, which is the French. It's not a really a sniper rifle. It's, it's what seven six two. Yeah, seven six two or seven five if it's a FRF one. Yeah. Um, it is not what I would call a high level sniper rifle. It is what we in the in the English speaking world would Hunting call a ma- <laughs> yeah ma- marksman's rifle. Yeah. Same as uh, elk uh, rifle or something. Yeah, like that. something yeah. like that. It's mm. a bolt action yeah. uh, with a scope, um, two bipods, and I mean up to up to eight hundred meters. It's good. Mm. Beyond eight hundred meters, the sights are beginning. I mean, it was an old sight. Yeah. Uh, I think it was a copy of the German sight from the Second World War. Oh, yeah. uh, once more reliable, but yeah. over eight hundred meters is not is not uh, yeah. So we use it at marksman. They are not snipers. Snipers no. is something else. Yeah. Um, uh, but we use that for us in the desert. It has no other mission than shooting the old uh, um, there. What do you call them? Dick, dick. We call them small uh, impala. So yeah, okay. we eat them. We yeah. Eat them. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you use it as a hunting rifle. Yeah, it's a hunting rifle. Um, But we don't use that for uh, for military purposes there. At least that was not necessary. It could no. be. I've never no. seen it no. becoming necessary in the desert. No. Uh, yeah. Uh, we have guns, you know, cannons yeah. that can bear two two kilometers. So yeah. we don't need a sniper. We just no. send three ninety millimeters down the range, and and things changes. Things changes. Yeah. 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 So that's. Uh, And you also have different uh, ammunitions for the for the tanks as well, or, uh, or yeah, you yeah. have armor pressing, you have exploding, you uh, have actually you, you have to don't not go in too complicated. You have one ammunition to kill all the tanks. Yes, you have one ammunition to explode people and buildings, and you have one ammunition to start fires and smoke. Yeah, yeah. To keep it simple. Yeah. And um, they, they, that's mainly what they, that's what we use. And the whole concept is to have these three cannons available in order to be, bring a lot of firepower hundreds of kilometers away in an autonomous yeah. Uh, yeah. situation. So uh, I learned a lot uh, in a few days just getting the first uh, click, click, yeah, click, click, click and, and, and and you know, keeping the jeep alive is is uh, is quite a job. It's quite a job. It I was believe. 45 years old. You have to be on the ball all the time. Uh, make sure the driver selects the right part of the road because well, there is no road, but uh, you can go out on a on Find a the s- right pattern. Yeah. yeah. If you go into a soft spot, you just sink. Then, up either you can get out it easily by giving speed immediately and then sort of climb out, or if you dig in, we have tricks. We have some mats and we have some quick solutions, and then. Well, a lot of work if you go down. It's well, 
don't forget, click, click, the other guys are moving. You need to keep I'm up. I'm playing my reputation that I have to keep up. And I'm playing my reliability to provide uh, a flank. Mm. So I immediately jump out with the other guy and we push or lift it out of the hole or we, we make a solution. And uh, should I be blocked, I'm click, 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 click. Then I know that uh, the idiot out there has a problem. Mm. I avoided that uh, most of the time. But um, it is very dynamic, uh, very hard because it's hot. You're cooking. So we are well dressed to sweat uh, inside. Our sleeves are long. We have hats covering every. There is no, apart from your fingertips, there is no other uh, part of your body exposed to the sun because you will be cooked, especially if you come from the north of Norway, like yeah, me. Get burned as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, so it's warm. The engine is working, and we have to observe on binoculars, and things are bouncing around. It takes some time to learn, but. Uh, uh, it is a fantastic satisfaction when you start to master it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. After two weeks, uh, when I'm standing in the jeep, I have learned to keep my foot blocked so I don't move uh, with my binoculars. I feel like Rommel. I'm on the flank. We are controlling the situation, and uh, we don't get stuck anymore. It's it's quite fascinating, and um, you learn so much about technicalities. You know so much about the sand, about the desert, about how to repair. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. Um, as you might have seen now in modern days, I often go to the desert in my current work, and yeah. I, it's a pleasure to be the expert. I never get stuck. You never yeah, get stuck. No, no, no. I'm the master in the Middle Eastern oil industry for not getting stuck in the yeah. desert. Yeah. Uh, and it, uh, it, yeah, it's, a, it's a good learning curve to have. But in uh, in uh, <coughs> all that work you have, you know, I understand uh, you don't have the pleasure of any luxury. How how you eat, how you sleep, and uh, and uh, how do you make your quarters in nighttime? Because when you're out on on a savanna tour, mm -hmm. uh, you also have to sleep sometime. And how much usually you sleep on a patrol like this, and and how do you feed yourself? You know. The sun goes down, let's say it's simple, at 6 o'clock. Yeah. And it comes up at 6 o'clock, to keep it simple. Mm. You're not doing anything between those two. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, what we would do in a, in, a, in a situation like this, we, of course, group together, and we put up um, a defensive perimeter. So, usually what you do, we, we get the trucks up, we put up uh, organization uh, for food and a fire and all this, and we put a tank, our uh, armored vehicle and a jeep with observation further away. Okay. And in the back, or usually down in a valley, or in a, no, valley is a big word, but in a, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, things are made normal as, uh, as other camping uh, <laughs> tourists, you know, the, that's not a problem, but, um, we have a, it's very simple, it's rolled out, the food is there, and there is a rotation of cooking, so somebody is cooking. But uh, you're cooking on an open fire? Or yeah, yeah, gas, we have a gas in the truck. A gas in the truck. Yeah, yeah, a gas in the truck, so that, or you can, you can, you know, there is not so much wood to start fire, so so we have a gas in the truck, and we have a measured amount of food that is um, that is predisposed, so we just heat this box of, uh, of food that is supposed to be eaten that day and we dispatch it. But you organize the tent or you sleep on the No, opening? there's no need for a tent. No no, need, no. It doesn't rain, doesn't, no. No, waste and of time. <laughs> no, 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 you just. How is that feeling first time you was out in the desert and you, and you sleep on the open? Then you discover that there is a billion of a billion stars. Yeah. Yeah. Because you have no light source, no nothing you can see up, yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. But, you know, you have been driving the whole day. <laughs> <laughs> you can't count too many stars before you go to sleep, huh? No. And yeah, it's still in a war zone, so we keep it discreet. And we have two crews on ops all the time. Yeah. So there is a corporal awake at any moment. Yeah. Since we only have four corporals, that means that I will be awake at least... Normally we take two by two, so I'll be awake half the night anyway. Yeah, as guard duty. 
and uh, there will be two or three legionnaires, you know, wanting manning the armored vehicle and 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 the machine gun. So we will have a a, a team that is awake. So you don't sleep so much, no. but um, that's part of life, yeah. you know. That uh, shapes the shapes the youth. But no beer or nothing else there. Oh yeah, we would have beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. not so much because you know it's limited what you can fill in the jeep. The French army is not so restricted to to um, to to alcohol. Alcohol could uh, is not as long as you're not drunk, nobody will ever say anything. Yeah. So so alcohol is is quite normal to have. The, the Chadian beer is called Gala. Gala. It's absolutely disgusting, but uh, <laughs> in the desert, uh, <laughs> everything tastes okay. Yeah. Warm Gala. Mm, well. That's Don't miss it, that. Yeah, we have another thing that is uh, particularly disgusting, which is called vino gel. That's red wine. Um, no, uh, it's a little bag of plastic that contains a sort of a jelly, a bit like jam, silk yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. and uh, it's a little piece like this, and you squeeze it in your in your uh, can. And you fill it. It it takes. It gives two and a half deciliter, twenty five centiliters of water, and this it will give you red wine. Oh, beautiful! It is disgusting. Um, but you drink it anyhow. Yeah, yeah, I hated it, but I mean, it had to be one of the boys. Oh. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. And and the senior corporals, the old corporals, you know, they just put less water, so it becomes sort of thick glue. And they love it. They eat the wine. Yeah, they yeah. eat the wine. It <laughs> is absolutely horrible. Uh, for somebody who likes wine, it, it should be forbidden by all rules. But, uh, but we had it. Uh, I even get uh, goosebumps <laughs> 40 years later. <laughs> <laughs> but you did, you did drink it, yeah? Yeah, yeah I had some yeah. of it, yeah. But usually I just give it away, you know. So uh, yeah. Same, I was about 15, 16, when I would start work at sea. Mm. And I didn't drink coffee. It yeah. was not a question. You have to learn to drink coffee if you stay. It makes sense, especially yeah. up in the north. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They don't have very good coffee, but we, we get used to it, yeah. 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 So so then a normal night is sleeping out in the desert with mm. the with the sky as a roof, mm. uh, eating uh, a cup of wine, uh, and a, a and do your guard duty. A cup of wine and the food will be. Um, uh, we had these uh, boxes of five kilos of ravioli or spaghetti bolognese or something oh. like this. So, sort of a can with five kilo. It works for a lot of people. It's very good. Yeah. And just keep it in the sun in the afternoon so you don't even have to cook, cook it. it. You can just eat it straight away. <laughs> <laughs> I was 40 kilo lighter than today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's a very interesting, uh, uh, it's difficult to explain, but you, you know, once more, you are in the desert with your family, with the guys you are living with, that you are working with, they're staying with all the time. So it becomes a really, really, it's it's quite um, quite a nice experience of bondage. Yeah. Uh, you live through things together that uh, that that you remember for life. Yeah, for sure. And and it creates a, a we call it in French esprit de corps. You know, a, a feel, feeling of of unit that is that is quite exceptional. Mm. And um, yeah. Uh, don't know what I can tell. Um, so the first part of uh, of your explaining child is uh, is uh, patrolling. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And uh, did you experience something on the on the first patrol? So how long oh. you stayed? Four, five, six months? Uh, we stayed there. Uh, yeah, five months. Five months. So um, as I said, the Libyans were pulling out. Mm. We had situations where where uh, uh, we can call it combat if you want but i don't want to put myself in any i was not in danger in any way but uh -huh. the, the 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 front unit got in contact with the with evacuating libyan troops and it wasn't enough to shoot a few rounds and they would pull out yeah. but it was a very very good experience for me because i, I got a soft learning mm. of what it was to come yeah uh, and i feel that this operation was more for me a training of Learning the desert environment, learn, learning a, a real combat environment without being all the time threatened. We didn't go into the Battle of Stalingrad. No, no, know, no, no, no. Yeah. 
So for me, it was was very very interesting to learn this uh, this uh, chart rotation, and it was a very nice build up for 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 later operations. So, but but when you you, you come from top of the north, and mm. uh, and the people come from Norway, no, mm. this is a big shithole. Oh no! Oh, no. <laughs> the, the, the Norway is a shithole. No, the, the up top north. No, no, I just of course I, it's I, a shithole. I mean, joking, but it's, it's cold. It's dark. Uh, it's not too much people, uh, and you have. Um, a little bit different culture uh, on north of uh, of the Norway and your house out, but when you come from your cultural background and and you st- find yourself in the desert, you find a different. Uh, number one, your new family come mm-hmm. from all shatter all over the world, and and you also have to meet civilians mm-hmm. and uh, a different culture, different food. Um, you can if it's mosquitoes or oh, great, yeah, yeah. Well, the thing in the desert, you know, there are no mosquitoes. No, but uh, <laughs> but as soon as the sun comes up, there is a billion flies. So flies. you are not sleeping when the sun is up. That's not going to happen. Oh. So, uh, but that's uh, just a point. Uh, but um, yeah, it's a very very interesting learning uh, experience for a young. You no really reason. have to widen your sights, eh? Yes, and and that's why I I I think there was. I enjoyed every moment. Mm. Uh, maybe because I'm from north of Norway, and we have this <laughs> adventurous, uh, you know, experience or wishing to learn, to open up and see. I was, uh, I was having great time. Uh, but when you meet civilian people, do you see a lot of suffering or people in in bad shapes, or, or uh, because the, it's the, war there? The desert is is uh, poorly. Desert is poorly populated. It's mainly nomads living around, and um, only will find small water holes or wells where there will be some people living. And uh, we we would often go from water hole to water hole. You know, during during the seventies, uh, the French had um, made wells. Um, these wells are um, um, how can we say? About two meter, you know these concrete tubes we yes, make yes, under yes. the roads. You yeah. know that about two meters. So you just put them vertically and you pile them down yeah. until you get to water. Yeah. So the the wells are of varying depth. But you know, of course, they're in the in the bottom of what we call a wadi, which was a river millions of years ago, and there will be water further down. So, but they are always more than thirty meters deep, thirty, forty, fifty, seventy meters deep to to get water. Quite rough work for the for the civilians to just get it up. Yeah, there is um, it's basically a hole, and then there is a sort of a metal frame triangle. Yeah. And they would have buckets, and they use the camels. Okay, and they they got pulley and the camels, and they yeah, pull it up and the there. camel will drink a one twenty liter bucket in two seconds. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, if yeah. you give it to, <laughs> gone. gone. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and uh, we, we had actually one, I think it was in Delta Four. I forgot the point exactly. The Libyans had thrown some dead bodies in the, in the well to, to poison the well. And the locals were not too happy about that. And uh, neither was because he wanted to use the water. So we put up a thing to clean it up. And um, the idea was to send somebody down in the well to, to clean up uh, the miserable parts of, of, of people that would be eventually down there, or animals. We were not sure what it was. And um, so uh, we had one corporal uh, from Laos. He, he was the smallest corporal we had. Very good guy. I, I was I was going to have a drink with him. I, I reminds me now, he's a very good guy. And um, so uh, we, we took a... a, a, a a big bucket um, that we had, and we drilled holes, and knocked holes in, so water wouldn't stay so well in it. Yep. And we just hooked him up with. A, we made a out of our webbing, so we made a sort of a thing to hold him up. Harness, yeah, yeah a harness, and we gave him the bucket, <coughs> and uh, we hooked him up to that, and we put the, the cable on the jeep, and we pulled the jeep far away. And then, as the jeep closes up, he goes down. Okay. Uh, so we sent him Simple. down. Simple, yeah. It was deep, and he came down, and he came up again, puking like a pig, with some bits and pieces sticking out of the bucket. But he he was really sick, so they said, "Okay, let's send the stupid Norwegian down." Mm. 
So, but they thought since it was better put on a gas mask. And of course, the oxygen level is horrible down there. <laughs> so uh, I got a French army gas mask on myself. As you can know, this was the old, uh, we call them ANP gas mask. You might have seen even Second World War, you know, the window was like... Pointed on the small windows. Small yeah. rounds and things like that. Uh, I put on a helmet uh, to protect my head, but not um, only to protect my head. We put two these TL-22, you know, these uh, angled... Yeah. Uh, what do you call them? Flashlights. Yeah, flashlights. Flash yeah. 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 Same as you use in Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. What is yeah. The angle exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But this was with tape on my helm, yeah. helmet. And this, and I was hooked up on the same harness with the same bloody bucket that was attached, and I was sent down. And um, I remember going down, <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, I, I, am, a, I am an idiot. <laughs> uh, oh. And I thought, we are really amateurs, because now we are really improvising here. Because uh, If you I, get stuck down there, you're fucked. Uh, yeah, and I am hanging there. And I... I my idea came to the film Ghostbusters. I yeah, don't even remember. Yeah, it was yeah. a ridiculous film in the yeah. 80s or something. And I was hanging there. And uh, and of course, these flashlights did not light the same area as I could see with my eyes. So uh -huh. that was completely useless. And um, I got a radio, which was a Pepe <laughs> I get a picture of, uh, you know, the, uh, the pointy face of a giraffe yeah. with two eyes pointing uh, to the other <laughs> side. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> completely hopeless you know and and i have this radio that okay it worked but it's heavy it's hanging oh, around your neck oh, you know yeah, this old, old big yeah, one yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and here i go down and as i come down i i, I don't know how many meters i must think about the jeep how long the cable could have been yeah 45 meters maybe that's yeah. deep that's yeah, deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. i'm i'm measuring compared to the length of the that we drove the jeep for yeah. the other guy and as i came down there is no there was no clear difference between water and ground. So I just sank into some kind of Mont muddish mm -hmm. things, you know. And it was <laughs> completely dark. And I just grabbed there with my arms to fill in. And I put the the bones and pieces of uniform mm -hmm. and whatever, you know. And just pulled the thing and quack, quack in the radio. And up I went. So um try to keep calm. Yeah, that was that was quite an experience. Yeah. I um yeah. <laughs> Fun. <laughs> so of course I got up and uh, everybody was very impressed with my performance so they sent me down again. <laughs> uh, I did three trips until we were more or less cleaned up and um everybody was very happy to me and uh the the staff sergeant sergeant chef he he thought he was an Italian guy very nice he's ah, very good very good stuff so uh, I got a free shower that doesn't happen in the <laughs> desert no, often no, no. but um, I had got ten liters of water which is a fortune in the desert but I still stink dead body for 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 several oh, days and the crew was yeah. complaining with me in the jeep and they, ah, you stink I was like well that's uh, that's how it is and. Um, yeah, we, we we pulled some water out uh, the next day, cooked it, of course, uh, strongly. It seemed to be okay. And we told the, the locals to leave it two or three days to let it settle because they didn't want to cook the water. Oh. They don't cook the water? Yeah, they don't cook the water. So they got strong stomachs, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, we would go from well to well, talk with people. You know, we always have people who speak Arabic. Yeah, because they use also, also the wells... As a, like a waypoint, yeah, and they are the natural tracks between, and they're they're the only immovable reference point in this world. Yeah, you because know, because everything is moving with the wind and shifting. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So the so these wells are the point where people tend to stay, where they move around with their camels. In Norway, you call it a mare. A what? A mare. In Norway, and when mm. I started navigating at sea, yeah. we always have like mea, it's a waypoint. So mm. you look when this mountain is opening from this, okay, uh, then yeah. you go straight north, mm. and then you know where direction you could go. Exactly, so we would uh, we go there. So our, our trap will be up north following the, the um, uh, Libyan evacuation, and then we'll make loop west towards Niger, and then come down again uh, to our camp, yeah. where we'll get cleaned up, 
fixed and we'll do a week of guard or something like this, uh, you know, in our camp that is our house and our home. And uh, once we were uh, all set, well, we would just go back out again. Repeat. Yeah. So that was, um, I think, a very, very interesting learning curve. I, I, I'm, you know, I'm 21, 22 in charge of a jeep of three guys in the middle of a desert operation. Top of the world, mom. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, for a, for a little boy from the north of Norway that didn't know very much before, it was, it was quite an experience. It felt probably beautiful. It made the, the foundations for my whole rest of my career. So uh, I consider myself very lucky to have been able to, this is my, my, my first operation, uh, giving me a lot of experience that I could... Um, that I could uh, hold. So after about four or five months of this, um, well, Muhammad, uh, Muhammad Gaddafi finally got his troop back in Libya, so that calmed down and we decided to move all the equipment to the Central African Republic. Um, I think it probably is. Probably in Central Africa? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just <laughs> south of Chad. I'm, I was thinking, Somebody will probably go and on Google and and measure it, uh, but uh, we went from then from Salal to uh, Boire in Central African Republic. Um, it can be measured on Google. I'd say it's about three thousand kilometers. Maybe I'm wrong, oh. but uh, out of my my nose, uh, maybe a bit less. You know, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't remember. I wouldn't, but but it took uh, took took a while. So that was another trip through Africa where there is no roads or the roads are terrible and about a week or two weeks through the desert with all the equipment and now suddenly we have all the support trucks with us. Um, and but then you are traveling more or less in peacetime then. So yeah, this, this, this is a logistical move. There is, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But still a big experience to, to move that equipment that far because water, food, and safety for uh, for the drivers and everything, yeah? Everything is a big operation, and the roads are, they are horrible. Yeah. And then they are, you know, it's, it, the, every moment it's a death trap, yeah. you know? And uh, I remember we were crossing a river, or uh, there was some sort of a ferry, you know, a cable ferry? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's hauled by a cable, and over the river is maybe 200 meters, not a big thing, but both sides are very steep hills. And um, that's more or less like a like a platform pulled with a cable. Over. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah, you can take two trucks or something like this. Yeah. It's a small operation. I have a photo. <coughs> I'll give that to you. And of course, it was raining cats and dogs. So now we're coming here with heavy trucks sliding down this thing and just sliding out of control straight into this platform. Boom. Somehow we didn't tip over. I don't know how. <laughs> yeah, because the platform is not that steady, I believe, because in there they just build the platform for whatever they have. And yeah, and here you come with the eight, nine, ten ton of armored car down the hill. You know, that's... Um, that's not good. <laughs> no. So that was, a, was very hair-raising. But uh, Keep the tongue straight in the mouth and just point out. Yes. Just go yes. for it. And we, we were driving in jeeps. I uh, was still with my jeeps, of course, also. And uh, I learned the next thing. As soon as we came to the Southern Chad, the old senior corporal would stop us and said, no, no, we have to make. And they took these metal bars out and we had to put a metal bar that was about almost two meter high in front of the Jeep. Yeah. Because out in the desert, there is no obstruction. But in the jungle, they can put up cables to chop your head off. Oh. Because all the windows are bent down, they're open, you know. So then, uh, new learning trick. Everywhere in the in the jungle, you will have a metal bar up front of your jeep that will cut any cable that is put up in front of you to yes. to damage the crew. Yeah. And we got into to to Central Africa. Uh, then we have to go. I think Boar is more on the border of uh, Cameroon, if I'm right. Yeah. Quite interesting <coughs> job. There is a big French military camp that we installed there, and we we we, we did the last month or so with um, anti poaching operation patrols arresting poachers that was trying to kill elephants. Um, and that's civilian people. Is it organized? No, it's a mafia. It's uh, a mafia. Uh, yeah. Africa is is Africa is a big mafia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
But of course, the poor people doing the killing, they are, they are just the victims of a, of a system, you know. But um, more a policing operation. Um, some of my colleagues got into, got into a heavy fight with this, but, but uh, once more I was lucky. I was in another area. Yep. And, um, and I more or less got goofed a good gift of jungle experience. Yes, because that's a quite heavy experience. Yeah. It's yeah. a lot to learn. Yeah, and 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 it's you know, different from from north of Norway with rocks and uh, ice. I can't come from the desert, and now it was rainforest, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, elephants and crocodiles, and <laughs> so it was a new learning curve. And um, I was um, I was detached to um, French army um, artillery unit, mm-hmm. parachute artillery, called thirty five artillery regiment. And they were operating there with 20 millimeter guns on trucks. I don't know if you have seen. You can imagine a small truck with a 20 meter machine mm. cannon on the back. Yeah, because then it's not a machine gun; it's a cannon. Yeah, a yeah, 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 yeah. It's quite big, you know, and it's heavy, you know, and 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 more for artillery guys, you know, yeah. for serious. And uh, what, what reach do you have on those ones? Uh, 1800 meters. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. they can also have explosive projects. Oh, they have yeah. small explosives. Yeah, all yeah. of them. Yeah, yeah. They're not. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They are mainly use anti-aircraft. Okay. Yeah. That's the plan. But uh, in Africa, we tend to use them towards the ground. Yeah. And and they will provide support. What we call, you know, pull up and suppressing fiber. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, they were going on on uh, on trips uh, in the jungle, and they were. Uh, experimenting some 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 new stuff and i was a young corporal but you know i come from the north of norway and uh, as a child i was doing uh orienteering you know yeah i was not very good in norway so orienteering that's uh, like a running contest with a map and a compass exactly and you're going to find your way around and and uh, you have to click on some posts yep. to to prove and be and been to the correct posters and they take your time when you come back home, yeah? Exactly, and that that's more or less our national sport, mm. summer sport. I don't know anymore, but it, it was quite popular in the 70s when I was a, as a child. And uh, and uh, I, I wasn't very, very good in Norway, you know, but I was okay. But um, in France, I was very good. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have experience with this, and, and French don't have the same reference to maps as Norwegians, I don't know why. They usually get lost. I think uh, in uh, same in Norway, it's like a it's a community who's uh, it's uh, lived on uh, on sea from the back. So I think the navigation part is uh, yeah is quite important from the old days in Norway. Yeah, so yeah. maybe stuck from that time. Yeah, and also we were poor and lost, and we didn't have any uh, yeah roads and all yeah, that. Yeah. So, so yeah, so. Uh, yeah, I was lucky in my regiment uh, on these orienteering courses. I've never been number two, uh, not because I am good, but because the others are bad. Yeah. So I was detached there as navigator to to help them navigate through the the, the jungle and the, on the poorly mapped tracks and actually verify the map. And is it hard to find a waypoint? And because if you read the map and you can see some heights and some some valleys, whatever. But in jungle, it's I imagine very it's difficult to get oversight. Yeah. Okay. Now remember, we had we had the map and we had the tracks on the map, <coughs> and it was more a case of verifying that the map actually was correct, and we we. Uh, uh, yeah. More, and, and when you have small tracks, is it as a human track or is it an animal track? Or because you have no, no, no. These were, you know, you had twenty millimeter guns, so it, okay, yeah, so you, yeah, you yeah. drove along. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. driving. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 driving on tracks that yeah. was horrible, and then you know, excursion left and right, and yeah. And it was also more confirming the map because it was quite unsure that the map was confirmed to to reality. You know, this mm. has been made by photos of the jungle uh, 30 years earlier by okay. the French Air Force, you yeah. know, and it's, so it's more a checking. So it was me and another guy, a sergeant, who had this uh, qualification. We did this mapping. So that was a nice trip around the, the jungle, um, mm. learning how that worked, and I, I got a crash course in, in jungle warfare. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So... Um, did you experience any yeah, encounter with some civilian people and stuff? All the around? time, all the time in Africa, you know. 
because now we are not in the desert now we're in the jungle so there there's a lot Lots. bigger population uh there is a saying you know you can you can be in the bush in africa and you can drive around for hours seeing nobody as soon as you stop within 10 minutes there will be a guy dropping up with a stick on his shoulder yeah uh, how's it guys yeah uh, there is always people in africa always people yeah always uh, everywhere yeah <laughs> so yeah we had a lot of contact with the civilians yeah yeah mm. was that okay Yeah, they were, you know, they were not hostile. I mean, the the poachers were hostile, but that was another part of the operation. But in general, people are friendly. They want food, they want gifts, they want something. And yeah, we have stock and we create relationship all wherever so we you go. So you bring along stuff you can give away, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. of course. Yeah. yeah, you give a lot of stuff you can take away and you get some information. Where is the village? How many is living here? What are they doing? And yeah, there is. So you always try to build a picture of the situation. Mm. Well, people tell you whatever they want, but mm. when you are spoken to ten people, you start to get an idea of what's going on. Yeah, yeah. And um, it helps you also uh, build up a network. You you, you are sowing um, the seeds for the next guy. Yeah. Uh, by being correct, helpful, and so. The next if, guy. You, if you treat if you are ass, mm. the next guy is not going to yeah. cool yeah. yeah. So we we try to be be cool. Of course, there are <coughs> sometimes complicated. Uh, there are other uh, cultural rules than what we are used to, and uh, they have no limitation of taking advantage of us. They, of course, and it's understandable. So you have to be on your guards. So you if know. you turn it back on them, they're gonna. Oh yeah, rob you naked. Uh, they're gonna mm-hmm. rob you naked within fifty seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so that's. Uh, But that's a part of the deal, you know. So yeah, yeah. yeah you keep an eye open all the time. And um, I think, uh, yeah, as soon as that operation was wrapped up and all the vehicles were turned back into stockage, we flew back to France. Yeah. Same operation backwards. We uh, this time we went by helicopter. I think we were picked up by helicopters in. In this place called Boar, flown by helicopters to Bangui, which is the capital of, uh, of Central African Republic, and where we were picked up by. What kind of helicopter was flying? Always Puma. Puma, Puma is French uh, army helicopters. Yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah. they are operational. They're moving us. So, t- but it was more shuttle. They didn't have enough. So I think we were almost two days of shuttling all the people up and down. Okay, okay. But then you get a trip and have a look. You yeah, know, it's nice. Did you feel like your life as a soldier become real after that trip? You know, you flying over the jungle, you're out in the desert, you're mapping, you're talking to the local people, you, you're seeing and experiencing a lot. Then, then you have to start sink in. This is my life. Yeah, it's quite different from from what you have. And can you imagine what a trip it is? I I, I want to go <laughs> with you now when <laughs> yeah, you talk about exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. So. So now, now, now you're a part of a team that is completely drilled, that is your friends, that is actually your family because well, you have a family in oh, Norway, yeah. it's far away, but you're not seeing them for years. So you feel that you are part of 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 a of a group that is unbeatable yeah. and that is so reliable. So I I don't even have the words of the feeling, you know. So of course this creates. Um, a connection and um have to be like a prideness when you come back to France as well and you first time you been out there and shown yourself and what you're good for of course of course and 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 this creates you know soldiers fight for recognition and status yeah so suddenly i'm not the young corporal anymore no. i am a guy with yeah. experience i am a guy that you has, can uh, ask me my friend like, yes yeah. of course yeah no but it builds up Yeah. And I did a lot of these trips. So um, uh, you 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 build on experience and you 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 become a part of a system that's much greater than you. Mm. And don't forget this idea about a uh, a family sect, uh, a mm. group mm. that that is operating together and then Did you feel like you did the right choice when you volunteered for the France Foreign Legion? If I was 19 today I would join immediately again yeah oh yeah yeah for sure for sure absolutely do you miss the life no oh. um 
there, there are parts of life in your. I, I was lucky because I did my time, and it was about good. I could have stayed on, mm. you know. But、um, I've been lucky after. I suppose if I had been unlucky after, I would have regretted it. But now I went on another career, and yeah, because now you work in、uh, so、same thing in another way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but in a civilian way. Or, yeah, 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 yeah. So. Now you're like a security advisor for for.、Uh, That's correct. I'm a, a I'm a security manager for 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 companies in the Middle East. Yeah, yeah. Advising them on on security matters.、Mm. For the next ep- ep- episode,、uh, this is not the end of the trip, but、uh, next time,、mm. what place are you going to bring us in then, and what can we expect? Uh, next time、uh, we are going,、uh, we are going to go through the the position of the NCO, how、mm-hmm. to become a non-commissioned officer,、mm-hmm. and、uh, if you have, we will then、uh, see a little bit about the Indian Ocean,、uh, how to do jungle training there, how to operate in in those places. There's a lot of interesting to talk about, and.、Um, How training is done in general, and more about the structure of the regiment, and we'll see if we can do the Gulf War. I did the Gulf War after that,、yeah. and after the Gulf War, there is even more to come.、Yeah. We have Somalia, we have Eritrea, we have Djibouti, we have a lot of、uh, operations to cover. So,、um, and and after that, even more. So, yeah, fifteen years is a long time. But I think next time、uh, we'll see how it goes. But I think、um, how to make an NCO. How the training is done, how the legion is structured. I would like to get those things out, and if anybody has any question, don't hesitate. Yeah, remember、uh, he he doesn't have sore hair. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so use the comment seconds, people. You know. Yeah. You can、uh, you can reach us、um, at Facebook, CG Zoom、mm. Media, or Nordpod, and we also have CG Zoom Media on、uh, on YouTube、mm. and Spotify, iTunes, all the other places.、Mm. And、uh, for all the subscribes. And if you leave a comment, I mean a hell of a lot for us. And、uh, as I told, you have not sore hair, so ask question,、uh, give your meaning.、Mm. That that's、uh, the fundamental of the podcast. We all can have our own view and meanings and stuff, and we don't have to go to war anyway. We can talk about it. And、uh, if you are listening to this or looking at this, don't hesitate to share. Yeah, that's yeah because that, that's a. I see on YouTube you have a lot of、uh, movies or, or programs about foreign legion stuff, but this I believe, for me at least, is、mm. the first where we really go、uh, down detail. the t- tiny detail details all、mm. the way, yeah. And we also open up for questions. Yeah. So if you if you state your questions in the comment section, we're gonna actually answer it, and and、uh, Charles gonna bring it up as long as it's a normal question. Even the unnormal questions. Even unnormal questions, yeah. Yalla. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. A pleasure.